Well, tonight I feel somewhat like Brother Rue Porter. Some of you may be old enough that you remember Brother Porter. Brother Porter was a unique man. He had some very strong quirks about him. For instance, he would not eat or drink any kind of dairy product. He hated chicken and poultry of all types, which that was hard for preachers back in his day. He would drink no water other than that which came from his own well in Neosho, Missouri. And he was known to carry gallon jugs of water with him. And oftentimes, he would be gone for weeks at a time holding gospel meetings. And oftentimes, the rear seat of his car would be filled with gallon water jugs because he would not drink water from any other source. He would eat onions at every meal. And not just any onions. He wanted the ones that were the strongest and the most potent that he could find. He chewed tobacco. He was once asked in a question and answer session at the conclusion of one of his meetings, Brother Porter, is it wrong, is it sinful to chew tobacco? And his response, he says, yes, absolutely. It is sinful to chew tobacco unless it is Star Navy brand. And that was his brand of choice. But an interesting story is told of a meeting that Brother Porter was holding many years ago. And the host family that he was staying with learned about his love of onions. And so every evening as they would set the evening meal out on the table before the evening uh, time for the gospel meeting, they would set out a large plate that would be just mounded over with sliced onion. And Brother Porter would take it upon himself to eat most of those onions that were there on that plate. Well, the first night of the meeting, as the custom of many preachers are, Brother Porter was standing at the back door. And when the men would come in, they would shake his hand, they would extend some type of greeting to him. And as the custom with many ladies continue to be today, they would come in and they would give him a hug. They would greet him. Well, the elders got to noticing that as the meeting went on, and remember in those days, meetings would last two, three weeks, sometimes as much as a month. But they noticed that as the meeting went on, fewer and fewer of the ladies were coming in and giving Brother Porter a hug. In fact, they got to noticing that many of the ladies would go nowhere near this man. And so they thought, we've got a problem here. We need to find out what the situation is. We can't have a preacher here that the ladies of the congregation won't even go around, won't even speak to. So the elders spoke with some of the ladies there in the congregation. And they asked what the, the situation was. And they said very plainly that he smelled so strongly of onions that they could not stand to get anywhere close to him. Well, the elders thought, well, this is a real problem. They thought, we need to talk to Brother Porter and see if he would be willing to refrain from eating onions just for the evening meal before coming to the meeting. So we, we want everybody to feel like they can come up to him and greet him and communicate with him. And so they went to Brother Porter very kindly, very diplomatically, and asked him if he would please refrain from eating onions at the meal just prior to coming to the meeting. Well, Brother Porter's response was classic. He said, well, brothers, the women don't need to get that close, and the men don't seem to care. <laughs> well, if you notice tonight... I've kept my distance. Uh, and while I missed the handshakes and the hugs, there's a reason for it. This afternoon, Christy, Caleb, and Kaylee all tested positive for COVID. 
And before you decide to get up and start to flee away from me as if I smell like onions, let me tell you a little bit. I conferred with my doctor this afternoon, who is a close family friend, and he assured me that with this variant of COVID that is around now, that so long as you are fully vaccinated, and I have been, so long as you have had a negative COVID test, and I had a negative test this afternoon, and so long as you are showing no symptoms, and I am not, then you do not have to quarantine. In fact, he went so far as to say that you do not necessarily even have to wear a mask when you are in public. But I spoke with David and Tom earlier today, and I told them that this evening, so that you would feel safe, so that you would feel comfortable, that I would keep my distance tonight. Uh, I don't feel sick, as I said. I I don't have any of the symptoms. I tested negative. Uh, But I'm keeping my distance tonight, just so that you feel safe, so that you feel comfortable. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable here tonight. But I would appreciate you keeping Christy and the kids in your prayers Uh, they're not any very sick. They're not showing uh, many symptoms at all, but if you would, please keep them in your prayers. Now let's get into our lesson for tonight. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, we read of several matters concerning Jesus. We read about his teaching of a parable that there was a man who owned a vineyard. And he leased this vineyard out, the King James Version says, to husbandmen, literally was leased out to some farmers. And these farmers were ones that were not honest. They were ones that really in many ways were untruthful. Well, whenever it came time for harvest... The man that owned the vineyard sent one of his servants to go down and to observe and to see what was taking place. Well, these farmers that had leased the vineyard, they took hold of this servant, they beat the servant, and they sent him on his way empty-handed. Well, the owner of the vineyard sent another of his servants. The servant went and suffered the same fate. He was beaten. And he was sent back empty-handed. But then the owner of the vineyard, he decided he had to do something different. These farmers, they're not listening to the servants. They're not respecting them. So he thought, I'm going to send my son. And if I send my son as my personal representative, then surely they will respect my son. Well, he sent his son... And they killed his son. And they kept the inheritance of the vineyard. Well, ultimately what we see here, the theme of this parable was applicative to the way that the Jews were treating Christ. The prophets had been sent to them. They had been told that harvest was coming, that the kingdom was at hand, they needed to be ready. Many of them killed the prophets. And so God sent his son The Jews, they killed the Son of God. They put Him to death, this one, this stone that was to be the chief cornerstone. They mistreated and they killed the Son of God. Well, as this chapter continues, we see Jesus addressing a variety of questions that were being asked of Jesus. Now, most of these questions were one that had ulterior motives. They were not trying to find out the truth from Jesus. They were trying to tempt Jesus, to try to set a snare there in his path. Well, as we come to Mark chapter 12 and verse 28, one question that was asked, which is the first commandment of all? Now, while the motive behind the asking of this question is not revealed in the text, We can assume from the context that we see in these other questions that the one asking this question was not sincere in this. 
Again, he was asking this question to try to ensnare Jesus in some way. But notice the response that Jesus gave. Notice the answer in Mark chapter 12, 29 through 30. It says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, or one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Well, whenever we look at the response of Jesus, we see two main points that he's bringing out. And these two main points can be described by two little words. The first is the word must. There are things that we must do. We must give ourselves completely to the service of God. Notice that he mentions, and we'll talk about this more uh, in depth here in just a moment. But he says, with all the heart, with all the soul, with all the mind, with all the strength, we are to give ourselves completely in service to God. That's the must. But another point that he brings out in this verse, another small word, is the word can. What Jesus reveals to us here is this is something that we can accomplish. It's something that we can do. You know, God never requests or demands anything of us that we cannot accomplish. He never gives us a charge that we cannot fulfill. And so in this, when Jesus says that the first command or the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says this is something that you must do and that you can do. So we have the ability to do this. But notice Jesus starts out by saying that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. This statement is referring to the intellect of man. It's referring to that part of man that has the ability to think, has the ability to reason. And you know, we probably don't realize just how important what we think really is. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, we see the example of the Bereans. And the Bereans were called noble. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were being taught was the truth. If they were concerned about what they thought, they were concerned about the knowledge base that was there. And they wanted to make sure that what they were thinking, what they were believing, and what they were practicing was that which is harmonious with the Word of God. You may remember also that Paul told Timothy that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. But also Paul told Titus in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9 that we are to hold fast the faithful word as has been taught that we may exhort and convict the gainsayers by, excuse me, by sound doctrine. But folks, unless we know what the will of God is, how can we do that? If we have not studied His Word and have a knowledge of His Word, then how can we do what this passage says? How can we speak those things that pertain to sound doctrine as we're told in Titus 2 and verse 1? We can't do it. If we don't know the Word of God, we can't speak the Word of God. But what should our thoughts be upon? Well, Philippians 4 and verse 8 tells us that our thoughts should be upon things that are true, things that are honest, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, and things that are of good report. But can we stop there? Is it enough to just know about God? Is it enough to just know that Jesus is the Son of God? Is it enough to just have that knowledge base? No. 
Because if we go through life with simply an intellectual understanding and meditation upon His Word, then what we're going to find is that we will become very rigid. We will become cold and formal and ritualistic in the practice of our faith. We'll become very much so like the Pharisees that we read about in the New Testament. And so this is why Jesus takes this a step further. And if we go back to our lesson text once again, notice that he goes on to say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. So there's more to it. Another dimension to this concept. Well, in this passage, the heart is referring to the emotional side of man. It's talking about our feelings. Now with the heart, man loves God. You know, David is a wonderful example of a man that allowed his love for God to be seen in his feelings and in his emotions. If you don't believe me, go back and read the Psalms. Look at Psalm 100 at some time, and you'll see just how much he allowed his emotions to come forth when he was talking about God and his devotion to God and his need for God. But sadly, many times people will go to the extreme when it comes to our feelings and our emotions. Sometimes people will allow themselves to be completely overcome by emotions. Because in our society today, is it not true that mankind generally believes that what makes you feel good must be right? What makes you feel joy must be what's right. But so many times we see those who will allow their emotions to get stirred up whenever it comes to matters of religion. And so whether they are being taught sound doctrine or not, if their emotions get stirred up by it, this is good. This feels good. It feels right. Therefore, this must be right. It must be coming from God. But then, on the other hand, you see another extreme to emotions... They say, oh, we can never show any emotion whatsoever. We have to remain stone-faced and cold. We can never allow ourselves to show any joy, any excitement whatsoever. Yes, it is a fact that our emotions are not a sound guide. Our emotions are not what we are to base our entire understanding of God and our complete understanding of faith upon. Because our emotions can mislead us. If you don't believe me, why do we talk about there being pleasure in sin? Pleasure brings about emotion, doesn't it? Pleasure brings about joy. And how many times have we seen those that are caught up in sin and they won't leave it behind because they enjoy it. They find pleasure in those things. Their emotions are tied up in it. So whenever we come back to what Jesus is saying in this passage, whenever He says that we are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, what is He saying? He says that we are to give heartfelt service to God. We are to allow ourselves to feel emotion based upon the execution of our faith. Whenever we live a faithful Christian life, whenever we see the effects of the gospel upon our life, does that ever bring emotion? Absolutely. Does it ever bring joy to our life? Does it ever bring tears of joy to our eyes whenever we realize what Christ has done for us? Are our emotions involved? Yes. Yes, we are to know about God. We're to know the truth of the gospel. But we also are to allow that to touch our lives. We are to feel that. To have that emotion. But we understand that emotions follow obedience. Emotion is not something that leads to obedience. Emotion is something that follows our obedience. 
But also, we are not to solely rely upon our emotions as a proof if something is right or wrong. Because we can be misled. But we are to give a complete, wholehearted devotion to God. But then Jesus adds, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. Now here's where things get a little confusing. You may remember, and it's been probably about a year ago now, maybe a little bit more, one of the questions that was asked on a question and answer night is what is the difference in the body, the soul, and the spirit? That was a very interesting study. Because we see, ultimately, that these are three different dimensions of man. So here Jesus says that we are to love the Lord with all our soul. Well, the soul of man is not easily defined because we see it used in a variety of ways in the Scriptures, don't we? We see this word soul used in different ways. Well, mostly it's used in reference to that spiritual part of man. Now, man has been created in the spiritual image of God. But also we see passages that talk about the soul of animals. Well, in that sense, we see that it is being used in reference to physical life. Not being used in reference to any type of spiritual characteristics whatsoever. And certainly we could say that both human beings and the animals and even plant life have life. And so in that sense, we could say that they have a soul. But then we have to consider something that man alone has, and that is the spirit. And that is that spiritual aspect that God has given to us. In John chapter 15 and verse 13, Jesus says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many, and greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In each one of these verses, the word that is translated life, is the word, that, or the Greek word, that we also sometimes find translated soul. And so we see there can be some confusion here in looking at these words. But ultimately, we have to understand that man alone, of the creations of God, man alone is a spiritual being. The animals do not have a spirit. Yes, we could argue that they have a soul because they have life. Yes, we could argue that the plants have a soul because they have life. But they don't have a spirit. They are not spiritual beings, not created in the spiritual image of God. But ultimately, when Jesus says that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, literally what he is saying there is that nothing about this physical life should be attempted, should be controlled by, or governed by anything other than a love for God. The way that we live this life is based upon our love for God with all our soul. But then Jesus also says that we are to love the Lord our God with all thy strength. Well, like these other statements that we've seen in this passage tonight, this is another expression of complete devotion to our Heavenly Father. Our strength here refers to our talents. It refers to our abilities. It refers to the energy that we have. We must be willing to spend and be spent in the service of the Lord. And this requires that we not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Because after all, we don't belong to ourselves, do we? This body does not belong to me. It belongs to God. 
And we are to do as we have been commanded. We've been bought with a price. We belong to God. And the price that was paid for us is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul said, You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. We were bought with the price of the blood of the Son of God. Therefore, we're not to serve man, but we're to serve God. It's like those apostles when they were called before the council and they were told, we're going to beat you and you better not go out and speak anymore the name of Jesus. Well, after they were beaten, they went back out and they immediately did what? They immediately began teaching once again. They were drugged back in before the council. And I can just imagine the conversation that took place. Did you not hear what we told you? Did you not hear... The command that we gave, you're not to be talking about Jesus. And I love the response that was made. We ought to obey God rather than man. Folks, we're to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, with everything that we have. And this first commandment, when it is obeyed, it will be the determining factor for everything else we do in life. If we truly love God the way that we're supposed to, that's going to change the way we live, isn't it? That's going to change our outlook on life. That's going to change our focus. Because if we love God the way we're supposed to, our desire is going to be to please God. To do His will. But also, when we become children of God, we need to understand that we are not merely responding to God's commands. We are not merely running away from hell and running toward heaven. While that is a part of it. When we become a child of God, We are accepting a life of full surrender. Meaning we are saying, as the song says, I am mine no more. I'm not focusing upon my desires and upon the way I want to live life, but I'm allowing God to direct my steps. I am loving God with all my heart. I'm putting God first in my life. We have to make that complete surrender to Him. And it must be a commitment. That commitment that we make that the way of God for man, what He has set forth in His Word, is the way that we're going to follow. That we're not going to just pick and choose what we like and throw out the things that we dislike. That we are going to surrender fully to the will of God. This is what loving God with the heart, the mind, the soul, and the strength means. And that's what this includes. But as we started the lesson with tonight, Jesus reveals to us in this short passage that this is something we must do. This is not an option. We must love the Lord with the mind, heart, soul, and strength. But he also reveals to us that this is something that we can do. We can submit to his will. We can live a faithful Christian life. We can have heaven as our home because we've lived faithfully. But tonight it may be that you examine yourself and you find that you've not been living life as you should. Maybe you realize that you've allowed sin to come into your life and to pull you away from God. Then if you are a child of God tonight and you find yourself in that state, then we encourage you to come out. Turn your back on the world and come back to God in repentance. Be restored back to His fellowship. Or it may be tonight that You examine yourself and you find that you've never obeyed the gospel. And possibly something tonight has been said that's caused you to realize the need to make a change in your life. 
Well, tonight, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then turn away from your sins. Come forward, confess the faith that you have in Christ, and be baptized. Your sins will be washed away. The Lord will add you to the church. And tonight, you can begin living a faithful Christian life. But tonight, if you examine yourself, and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, then we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.